Wow. You guys, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but you guys are blessed, blessed with some musical talent in this church. Man, uh, every night it's been somebody, and I've been impressed by the talent every night, but what I've really been impressed with is the way that you guys allow God to use you guys to do that. Um, because I know it's not hard. I, mean, I know it's not easy getting up here to sing. Um, I couldn't do it. I'll just be honest with you guys. I couldn't get up here to sing. Uh, that's that. Uh, it, it's something in me that uh, I'm scared that I'm going to look foolish uh, in front of people. Then uh, it's something that holds me back from doing that, and uh, which kind of leads into what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, I told you guys uh, sometimes I like to come up here and just uh, confess to you guys all my sins. You know, and uh, that may be one of them that I really struggle with is that sometimes I'm scared that I will look foolish. And I think that uh, it hinders me uh, in doing some different things. So I encourage you this. If you feel like God's leading you to speak, if you feel like God's leading you to sing, man, we got to find some way to push through that, don't we? Because, man, so many people get blessed by that. I mean, I've been blessed all three nights now uh, by people who are able to get up here and sing to you guys and, uh, and just let God work through them in that way. Um, also, there's something else I couldn't do. I could not cook like you guys can either. Man, I tell you what, last night was uh, amazing. Uh, I mean, just we went to a Mexican restaurant, um, Salsas, I believe. And uh, see, Jason and Cindy uh, took us out to eat. And uh, man, I got some of the best Mexican food I may have ever had. I don't know what that dish was I had, but it was really, really good. And then tonight, Mr. Leroy and uh, Miss Wanda fixed. Man, it was just like going to my grandmother's house. It was so good. Um, it really was. I am not, uh, that is no exaggeration. Your corn is just like my grandmother's corn. But anyway, I, I got a little bit of ADD in me, so it doesn't take me much to chase rabbits. But uh, what I've had to do the, every night is uh, Carrie's not with me. And usually when Carrie's with me and she knows that I got to get up in front and speak to people, she knows... Uh, how I get, uh, and I get all, you know, and, uh, but uh, with her not being with me, I've got to actually listen to that little voice in my head that says, don't push it, don't push it, you know, when I'm eating. So, uh, because I would eat a lot more than I eat tonight if I did not have to stand in front of you guys and talk, I, but I didn't, so maybe we'll make it through. So, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be here this week, God, and God, you've blessed me beyond, beyond my belief just to be able to bring me into a place that you've created that is so beautiful, God. And I'm just in awe every time I go outside and see the things that you've created. God, thank you so much for these wonderful, wonderful people here at this church, these brothers and sisters of mine in Christ. God, even though we live in different states and uh, we do different things, God, we're still brothers and sisters in you, and that is such an awesome thing to be around, God. God, it's so great to be around people who can lift you up and just bring you, bring, bring me before you, God. God, I pray that I do that in turn. I pray that I bring these people before you and that they hear the words that I say that are not my words, God, but it is all of you. Everything that you have to say pours out of me, God. And God, I pray that you do that tonight. I pray that you put me aside, put my ego aside, put my thoughts aside. Just completely put me aside, God, because they don't need to hear from me. God, I pray that you will open up their ears, and I pray most importantly that you open up their hearts tonight, God. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for the Holy Spirit that you have sent us believers today that works through us, God. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to now go to work. I'm asking you to fill this place. I'm inviting you in this place. I'm asking you and begging you to please help us to draw closer to you. Thank you so much for Jesus dying on the cross. In his name I pray. Amen. Um, uh, let's see. You guys might want to know a little bit more about me. Uh, I told my friend back there that I would tell my Dallas Cowboy story tonight. Uh, he's come in, and he's got his Dallas Cowboy jacket on every night. And uh, I, I used to not be a Dallas Cowboy fan. In fact, I was a Titans fan. Naturally, I'm Tennessean, and I was a Titans fan. I sure am not going to pull for the Bears just because I live in Illinois, right? But actually, it's more of a St. Louis area. But anyway... I'm not going to pull for either one of those teams, so I was a Titans fan, but I recently, this year, uh, you may say, so to speak, saw the light, uh, and I'm now a Cowboys fan, I guess, uh, but I have good reason to be. 
This year, uh, well, when I moved to Illinois, there was a gentleman there who lived there and his child, uh, as soon as we moved down there, his child, which is about the exact same age as my daughter, uh, was diagnosed with cancer himself. His name is Cannon McKee. He was diagnosed with cancer in his liver and his cancer was a stage four cancer. Um, now that, for those of you that don't know, that is the worst of the worst. That is uh, almost like a death sentence is what they say. Um, but my friend Mike and Shannon, um, his mother and father, are uh, very strong believers in Christ and they were praying and they, I watched them go through this with their son even before I knew my daughter had cancer. Uh, and miraculously, God took away his cancer. He has no more cancer. And the little boy is healthy and growing and fun and, and it's an amazing thing and it's really inspiring to me. But as soon as my daughter uh, was diagnosed with a brain tumor, one of the first people to come up to the hospital was Mike. Uh, and me and Mike have developed a friendship uh, that is like no other uh, because we both are, have gone through and are going through uh, having children with cancer. And Mike happened to be uh, a professional football player at one time. Um, and when I say professional football player, he played in the Arena League, which is a professional league, but he played also at Eastern Illinois. And his roommate happened to be Tony Romo, uh, the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And so him and Tony Romo are best friends. So I naturally said, hey, Mike, since we're best friends, I mean, that's pretty much me and Tony are best friends, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, Eric. And, and, you know, and so I would pick on him and stuff. And, uh, and, and so at just this last year, the, the Cowboys came to St. Louis to play the Rams. And Mike was, uh, you know, he called Tony up. And we went uh, with Tony. Uh, I like to call him Tony now. Just, we're first name basis. Uh, we went with Tony uh, to St. Louis. And uh, I got to go to the Dallas Cowboys chapel before the game. And uh, I got to sit in there. And as I was sitting in there, it was kind of amazing. You know, I'm sitting there and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, wow, there's a, uh, you know, there's DeMarco Murray. There's, I'm, I mean, I'm naming off all these, I'm a big sports guy. So I'm naming off all these pro athletes. And I mean, I'm with Tony Romo, you know, I'm the man now, you know, me and Tone. And so, uh, you know, and so uh, in fact, when I come up to Tony, Ro when I come up to Tony, sorry, I call him Tone. When I come up to Tony, he said, Hey Eric, how's Nancy? Man, when he did that, I was like, <laughs> you know, and so I, all this time as me and Mike are driving to St. Louis stuff, I'm just sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? I don't want to look foolish. I do not want to look foolish in front of the Tony Romo. I mean, you know, me and him could wind up being best friends. And, uh, you know, so I, I wanted to, I didn't want to look foolish like, uh, like some crazy sports nut and run up to him and, uh, you know, just, oh, Tony, I want your autograph and all this, you know. So we walk in there and we're in the chapel service and all these big, humongous football players are around me. And I mean, their necks are that big around. They are huge. And here I am, okay, <laughs> you know. In case you haven't noticed, um, I look nothing like a professional football player, okay? They, they thought that I was the speaker, in fact, uh, at that time. But uh, anyway, I, I sit in there and I'm doing everything I can. And in my mind, I keep going, Eric, don't do nothing to make yourself look foolish in front of these guys. Don't, don't do nothing to make yourself look silly in front of these guys. Um, and, and so that keeps going through my mind. And then here's what happened. The pastor, their team chaplain got up and started speaking. And all of a sudden, my focus wasn't on the Dallas Cowboys anymore. All of a sudden, I didn't really care about the Dallas Cowboys being around me because the word of God was being preached and this man was bringing the word of God. And what I found out was is that, the Tony, or the, that Tony Romo and all the Dallas Cowboys are what? People, yeah. just like me and you. And so all of a sudden, I got a knees about me. And, and I mean, I'm serious. I can still remember he preached on 1 John, you know, 1 John chapter 1. And, and I don't remember exactly who all was in there with me. And, and that's how awesome God is is and that's how much he overshadows people it made me realize for a moment you know what i'm sitting in the room with the dallas cowboys before a game and they're nothing because god is here you know and it was an amazing thing but all that to be said is how foolish i felt you know i felt foolish being around these guys because here i am five foot something you know <laughs> and uh these guys are 10 foot something, you know, and, and I just felt kind of foolish and I didn't want to look foolish. And so uh, I wished I would have brought a picture of me and Tony. Uh, you, you could tell, <laughs> you, 
You, you could tell with me and Tony that uh, he's, he's like got his arm around me, he's smiling and cheesing, and I'm like this. Because I didn't want to look like a crazy fan. I didn't want to look foolish. But isn't that uh, kind of what we do sometimes, though? We're, we're so scared that we're going to look foolish, especially when it comes to God and it comes to Christ. You know, we come to church and we're scared we're going to look foolish. We prevent ourselves from coming up here and speaking because we're scared people are going to think we're foolish. We're scared to come up here and sing because we're scared we're going to look foolish. And so here's the last thing that you have to overcome, I think, in order for you to have a personal revival is you've got to overcome that fear of looking foolish. There's a story in the Bible that I want us to, to look at tonight. It's a very familiar story. And uh, you could even say that uh, this story is very becoming of me. It's the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, and so if you've got your Bible tonight, you can open it up, Luke chapter 19. stand up and say something. Thank you. That is perfect timing. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 19, and starting at verse 1 is the story. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the, for the press, because he was of little stature. And he ran before, and he climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he saw him, and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste, and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be with the guest of a man that is a sinner? And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I take anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me ask you this. How many adult people have you seen climb a tree lately? Think about that. And that's just where we're going with this. Zacchaeus wasn't scared to look foolish, was he? You know, for some of us, we might think, oh man, Jesus is coming and I want to see him really bad. I want to see him so bad. But I, the only way I can see him, me being five foot whatever, is to climb up a tree. But I'm not going to climb up the tree because everybody else looking around and looking at me is going to say, what an idiot. What an idiot. Just to climb up a tree, just to see some guy. And, I'll, and we're scared because we're scared we're going to be classified as looking foolish to people. But that's something about Zacchaeus here. You know, we don't normally see a guy climbing up a tree. But let me remind you who Zacchaeus was. You, go, you, you may think, okay, well, some guys, they would climb up a tree. A lot of guys climb up a tree to shoot a deer, right? But this Zacchaeus was not that kind of guy. Zacchaeus was probably the kind of guy that you would see in a three-piece suit, you know, perfectly pressed suit, uh, the, the finest of watches on, the, the best of jewelry on, the, the, the man's, the gentleman's gentleman, you know, the, the fancy cologne. In, or, in other words, Zacchaeus was rich. And in other words, what Zacchaeus had was Zacchaeus had this thing called a reputation. And this reputation is something that was very important to Zacchaeus, and it was something that he must protect because he is known as this rich guy, and he's known as, you know, this classy guy who doesn't do things that are foolish. But yet he still climbs up a tree. And he didn't care how foolish he looked 
because he just wanted to get a little glimpse of Jesus Christ. You see, Zacchaeus was willing to look foolish just to get a glimpse of Jesus. When is the last time you and I were willing to look foolish just to get a little glimpse of Jesus? Just a little glimpse of him is all he wanted. And he was willing to risk his reputation. You see, Zacchaeus was a short guy. He was an Israelite. Uh, he looked at uh, the Israelites, they looked at tax collectors as thieves back in that day. They were Jews, but they were Jews who worked for the Roman government. So what does that tell you? They were considered traitors, pretty much. They were traitors back in that day. What they did was they collected taxes from their own people. He was not only a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector. He was like the man that trained tax collectors. He, was, he had been in a long time to be chief tax collector. And so he had been scamming people for a long time. You see, he was the big guy on the block. So I want you to think about that, and I say that because you need to realize how much that that man risked to climb up a tree to just get a glimpse of Jesus. He risked his entire reputation. It was on the line. Have you ever, ever in your life went to great lengths and inconveniences just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Oh, sure, we come in here. We come in our churches. And we come in our churches rightfully so to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Rightfully so. But when was the last time you went out and was willing to look like a fool to do that? Was willing to lay your reputation on the line just to get a little glimpse of Jesus? See, that's what Zacchaeus does here. Have you ever sacrificed your reputation to follow Jesus? Because you see, I think of what's happened in our society today is many people will make it look like, you know what? If you follow Jesus, it really doesn't take that much. Really, to follow Jesus, all you need to do is come to this altar, pray a prayer, and bingo, you're done, and you're a follower of Jesus. You see, that's where we're sadly mistaken. That's not it. This isn't where it ends. Yes, this is a part of it, Okay? It's a huge part of it. But it doesn't stop right here. Right. It, you carry that with you your entire life. You see, following Jesus means this. You're willing to look foolish. You're willing to take the criticism. Let me remind you of something. What did Jesus say? Look, they hated me, so what makes you think they're going to like you? If you're really following me, then they're not going to like you. Are you willing to look foolish just to get a little glimpse of him? If you don't know what God is looking for, it's very hard to please him if you don't know what he's looking for. You know, and some of us really, I don't know if we know exactly what it is God's looking for. But the Bible is very clear about what he's looking for. If you read the Gospels, you'll find out that God's looking for tax collectors who climb trees. He's looking for prostitutes who crash parties. He's looking for people who push through the crowd just to get a little bit closer to him so they can touch his robe. He's looking for people who will cut holes in the ceiling just to lower their friend. He's looking for people who will jump out of a perfectly good boat onto water. He's looking for people who follow stars to find a little baby. You see, don't you get it? Every one of these people looked foolish. They all looked foolish to the people of the world. They all looked foolish, but guess what? That's what God is looking for. He's looking for us to be willing to look foolish for him. You see, you're not looking foolish to God when you do this. You're looking foolish to man, but who cares? Remember last night we talked about that? What are you scared of men for? I'm scared of no man. He's willing, or he's looking for people who aren't afraid to look foolish in seeking him. You see, that's what faith is. You want the definition of faith? Faith is the willingness to look foolish. It's the willingness to look foolish for God. Do you have faith like this? Is this what your faith is like? Because I get it now. You know, a few years ago, I don't know if I did get that. I, I, people ask me if I had faith in God, and yes, I, I, I did. I mean, I would say yes. 
But man, I, I, my faith in God now is this. I don't care what anybody thinks. You know? <laughs> I don't care if you think I'm foolish. I don't, think, I don't care if you think I'm goofy because, you know, I'm happy when I shouldn't be happy. You know? You know, I get people telling me that. Actual people telling me that. Actual Christians and brothers, Christian brothers and sisters tell me I shouldn't be happy because, you know, my daughter's got a brain tumor. Really? See, you, you just don't get it then. You don't understand it. If you're telling me that, then you, you don't understand it. You see, you need to be willing to look foolish for God. All the characters in the Bible were like that. All of them. All the patriarchs. Noah? My goodness. How foolish did that man look, you know? You think about it. Noah, for the next 120 years, rain's not in the forecast for 120 years, and Noah's out there hammering away on a boat. Don't you know and don't you remember reading about the people coming up and mocking him? Oh, by the way, they weren't mocking him whenever they were banging on the door trying to get in, you know. Remember David? King David? The man who has the title that I would love to have one day? A man after God's own heart? Yes. Don't you know he looked foolish whenever he said, you know what, that Philistine over there, I, I, that big giant... I'm sick of hearing him talk about my God. And none of you are going to take, try to challenge him. I'm a little boy and I got a slingshot and I'm going to go knock him down. Don't you know that everybody was saying, what are you doing, little boy? That's foolishness. I don't think they said that whenever he brought his head back, did they? Don't you know that the man we talked about a few nights, Benaniah, Looked foolish. All the people around him saying, what are you doing? You're, not, you're, you're jumping in a snowy pit with a lion? He did it. Don't you know that the wise men that were told to follow the star, they were told that the Jewish border agents, by the Jewish border agents, you know, whenever they come up to the Jewish border agents and they said, what are you doing here? And the wise men said, uh, we're out to find the Messiah, the baby. He's a baby. Are you sure you're wise men? Because that's pretty dumb. You see, they were willing to look foolish. And man, think about that awesome gift that they got to see because they were willing to look foolish. Think about the, the 12 disciples, you know. They were all professional fishermen. Professional fishermen. But yet they were willing to look foolish and take up everything they got, drop it, and follow Jesus Christ. In fact, they were willing to look foolish one of them in particular is willing to look foolish enough to be able to step out onto a boat because he saw Jesus walking on water and Jesus said, come on. You know, I, I don't know if I could have, I, would, I don't know if I would have looked that foolish, you know. I would have looked around and said, I don't think so, <laughs> you know. But he was willing to look foolish. Most importantly, here's, here's where it really hits me. Jesus Christ. I want you to think about that for a moment. How foolish was he willing to look? as he hung on a cross. Yes. And I'm sure, listen, you know, me and Brother Billy was talking about this at supper tonight. I don't think that the pictures we see of Jesus portrays a very good picture of him on the cross, okay? I, 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 don't, I think that they do this because it wouldn't be child friendly. I don't think he had a stitch of clothes on. That's right. And so don't you know as he's hanging there, bloodied, battered, naked most likely yes. don't you know as they're sitting there spitting on him making fun of him casting dice for his clothes how foolish did he look but he was willing to look foolish yes. and he was willing to look foolish for yes. fools like me now all these people of faith is the willingness to look foolish but the results the results of these people's faith, well, they speak for themselves. You know, Noah, Noah was saved from a flood. David, David wound up killing a giant. We know the rest of the story with that man. The wise men, they wind up getting to see the best Christmas present ever. Peter got to walk on water. And Jesus, well, Jesus defeated death because he was willing to look foolish. You see, here's the problem. Many of us are, uh, uh, we've never been able to kill that giant. We've never been able to walk on water. We've never found the Messiah because we're not willing to look foolish. 
We're not willing to look foolish. We're scared. What's first, what's first Corinthians 1 27 say? It says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So what foolish thing is it that God's really asking you to do, okay? You want revival? I can't make you. I can't, okay? I'm a young pastor, I get that. But I've, I've learned, uh, you know, that I, I can't make people follow Jesus. I can't make people do anything. People have to be willing People have to want it for themselves. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want revival within your own self, and if you want revival within this church, one of the things you're going to have to do is be willing to look foolish. You know, don't get on to me. I just read you off all that stuff in the Bible. I didn't say that. That's what happened. That's history. That is the proof in the pudding you have to be willing to look foolish. If you want to experience God on a level that you have never, ever, ever experienced him before, you've got to be willing to look foolish. It's just the way it is. And let me be honest with you. In the, in the last days when you're standing before Jesus Christ, I promise you this, you're not going to be the one looking foolish. You're not going to be the one looking foolish. You know who's going to be looking foolish? It's those who are told by Jesus, away from me, I never knew you. And those who are sitting there begging Jesus, hey, uh, but I prophesied in your name. I came to church seven days a week, Jesus. I read the Bible. I read it every year. I read the Bible, Jesus. Jesus is still going to say, hey, you did all that stuff. That's all fine and dandy, but I didn't know you. You didn't want to know me. You didn't want to look foolish for me. You didn't have enough faith in me. But to those of us, to those of us who are willing to look foolish, Jesus is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You see, to me, that is the crux of everything right there. That is the, one of the best verses in the Bible and one of the scariest worst verses. Well done, my good and faithful servant, and away from me, I did not know you. Faith is the willingness to look foolish, and guess what? We just read about it. God uses the weak. Yes. He wants to use those who are foolish. That's who God uses. God, I don't see it many times in the Bible where God uses somebody that is strong and you know, mighty. I know there are times there's Samson and all that. I get that. But man, story after story after story in the Bible, it is the people who nobody chose. That nobody chose. Nobody picked David. You know? You remember that? You remember when David was <laughs> the ruddy kid? <laughs> I believe that's how Samuel described him, you know? Yes. He's ruddy. Yes. Nobody picked him. Nobody picked Abraham. Nobody picked any of these people. These people, these people were chosen by God because they were willing to look foolish for God. They didn't care what the other people thought. And so what foolish thing is it that God's asking you to do? What lion is it, so to speak, that you need to chase? And don't you have this longing deep down inside of you to do something crazy for God? See, I got this longing, and I've had it now for about a year, maybe a year and a half. And, and I tell people this, and this year I finally just said, you know what, I'm doing it. So I put, the, I put my name to it. I signed up, starting to do money for it. You know, I, I, wanted, I felt like God's been telling me for a year and a half, hey, Eric, I, I want you to go on a mission trip. Okay, God, I'll go, uh, I'll go fold boxes at the local food shelter. Eric, that's great, and, and I need people to do that, but that's not the one I need you to do right now. Eric, I want you to go on a mission trip that people are going to say you're dumb for going. Okay, God, what is it? I want you to go to the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, I get that reaction. You know, what? The Middle East, have you checked the news, Eric? Yeah. I know they're cutting people's heads off. I know I got a daughter with a brain tumor. I get that, and I got to take care of her. I know all this. I know, I know all your reasonings, and I get that, and I understand that. But you know what? There's something, there is something inside of me 
that says, if I don't do this, then something's going to be missing. And, and I'm not for one minute am I saying, you know what, this is what God, this is where God's calling me. Because I really don't feel like that is where God's calling me. I don't feel like it's full-time missions right now, and that's great. But for some reason in me, there is something in me that God's saying, I need you to go and do this right now. It's, it's like eight days, Eric. You can do it. Okay. And man, whenever I said okay, whenever I signed up, it was just like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. It was so weird. You know, a weight's been lifted off my shoulders because I've signed up to go over to the Middle East. <laughs> I know it sounds weird. It's foolish. But faith is the willingness to look foolish. Now, look, I don't tell you that because I want you guys to go, oh, he's so good. <laughs> yeah, he's got it going on. He is so faithful to God. Look, I, I am messed up, <laughs> okay? I'll just be honest. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm messed up. But you know what? I have messed up so many times that, and I know I'm going to continue to mess up in my life, that I want to do the best I can now. I want to be willing to look foolish. I'm not saying it's going to work out every time. I know it's not. It's, but that's part of faith, right? And so you know, maybe there's somebody in here that's got something deep down within them that, man, they're just saying, oh, God's put something in my heart. I don't know what it is, but it scares me because I think that people is uh, going to think I'm crazy. Do it. I just read off a big list of people, an entire list of people. In fact, we can go in the Bible and find even more people yes. that are like that. Yes. See, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Yes. You know, don't let the fool or don't let the fear of looking foolish paralyze you. So many times we do that. We let the fear of looking foolish tell us things like, I can't share my faith with people because I look foolish because I really don't. If they ask me a question, I don't know. I'm going to be able to answer it. Or I can't pray for a miracle because what about if that doesn't happen? You know, that's something that I struggle with, okay? I have a hard time with that. I want to pray for a miracle for Nancy, and I do. I pray for a miracle for Nancy. But you know what? There's this part of me that I start thinking... If I pray for a miracle, and if I tell people I'm praying for a miracle then, uh, and it don't happen, then what's going to happen is, well, I, I, I'm going to make God look foolish like he doesn't know how to handle it. But then really deep down inside of me, what it is is, Eric, that's not really what you're worried about. What you're worried about is you're going to look foolish because you put all your trust and hope in me, and people are going to think that it didn't work out. You see, faith is the willingness to look foolish. Maybe you need to get involved in a ministry, but you're not going to do it because I'm scared you're going to look foolish. Maybe this needs to happen. Maybe you need to seek out counseling, you know? Maybe you've been needing to get counseling from somebody, from a Christian brother, a Christian sister, a, your pastor, maybe even professional Christian counseling. Maybe you're needing counseling and you know it, but you're, you don't want to do it because, well, people will start talking about you but you're scared to look foolish. Maybe you're in school and you know God's not leading you down that path that you signed up for in college and maybe you're in your fourth year of your electrical apprenticeship and God, you finally all of a sudden say, yep, God, you're right. I'm changing my entire career and it winds up taking you 10 years and you finally are satisfied because you finally listened to God. Oh, wait, that was me. Say, I was scared to look foolish. And because I was scared to look foolish, it took me 10 years, you know. Maybe you really know that you need to quit your job, but people are going to think you look foolish because, you know, you need that paycheck to make it. you, you got to have money to make it. It's a good job, and the job that you really feel drawn to, you know, it's not paying as good, and that would be foolish to quit this good job. But if God's telling you in your heart that this is where I want you, you're not going to be foolish. Because let me tell you this, money's not going to take care of you. It's going to burn up like the wind, man. It's going to be gone. God is. So be willing to look foolish. Maybe you're thinking, I can't ask her out, you know, because <laughs> I'll get rejected. Oh, wait, that was me in high school, right. Maybe you're thinking, I can't raise my hand and ask her the question. Maybe you're thinking, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. 
because I'm scared I'm going to look foolish. You see, there's real fear here. And there's real fear that we will look foolish. And how in the world do we overcome that? How, how do we overcome that feeling that we're going to look foolish? Here's how we overcome it. It's going to be a weird verse, but stay with me, okay? Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, like I said, stay with me here. Have you ever been around somebody that's been drunk? What happens? They lose all their inhibition, don't they? They don't care anymore, you know? They don't care. It seems like they lose all their inhibition. You see, what Paul is saying here is that wine is the wrong way to lose those inhibitions. Wine is the wrong way to lose those inhibitions. What you need to be filled with is the spirit. Yes. That's how you lose your inhibitions. That's how you're not scared to look like a fool anymore. Is whenever you allow the Holy Spirit to come inside you and work through you. See, being filled with the spirit will help you overcome your godly inhibitions. See, when we're filled with the spirit, we start to care less and less and less about what people think and we start caring more and more and more about what God thinks. Talk about not having any inhibitions. You remember Adam and Eve before the fall? Yes. They walked around the garden and, you know, they were nude. They didn't care. They didn't know. They didn't know, you know, that there was something to be ashamed of. They were running around with no clothes, not a care in the world. But then... Then sin came into the world, and what happened? It's always, as a kid, I would read that, and I'd go like, I'd, I'd be like, why is that in there? I, should that even be in there? That's the Bible, you know? Why did, why did God talk about this? And especially, why did he talk about this being the first thing that they did after they sinned is that they went and sewed fig leaves together and tried to put on clothes? Hmm, here's what I think it is. Genesis 3, 7 tells about it. It says, um, and the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves aprons. You see, here's what I'm figuring. Here's what it, it comes down to is that I think that being self-conscious is part of the curse of sin. It's part of the curse of sin. The more we sin, guess what? The more self-conscious we become, right? The more we sin, the more we start caring about what other people are thinking about us. And we start having to lie so that we can impress the Joneses. I'm, I hope there's no Joneses in here. If there are, it's not you. You know what I'm talking about. See, becoming filled with the Holy Spirit helps us become less self-conscious and more God-conscious. And you see, that's where we need to be. We don't need to be self-conscious. We need to be more God-conscious. Erwin McManus says this. He says in his book, Unstoppable Force, he says, the center of God's will is not a safe place, but it's the most dangerous place in the world. To live outside of God's will puts us in danger. To live in his will makes us dangerous. You see, in a culture, in our selfie-obsessed culture, in our culture obsessed with self-protection and safety, you could choose to run after opportunities instead of letting them come to you. You can embrace uncertainty instead of seeking to eliminate it. You can choose to take risk rather than minimizing them. You can confront your fears instead of hiding them. You can reframe your adversities instead of letting it dominate you. And you can embrace your foolishness as a mark of the following of Christ in you. In short, you can have the choice to chase lions and confront them head on, knowing that you have the Holy Spirit, knowing that you have the power of God on your side, and no adversity, no fear, no uncertainty, and no scared that you're going to be foolish in front of people, and you can chase after it with all you got, and you can have revival in your heart, and in your church, and in your life, or you could choose to do nothing. Tomorrow night, we'll talk about the outcome of that. 
You see, I think that a lot of people that choose to do nothing will hear those words, away from me, I never knew you. And those people that have the guts, they'll hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. Start chasing. Start chasing after God. When you start chasing after God, I promise you this, you will start living. So many of us are walking around in live bodies, but dead as a doornail. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for tonight. God, I pray. I pray that you give us a spirit of confidence. Nothing confident in ourselves, God, but realizing that we are confident in you and in who you are, God, and who you made us to be. God, I pray for this church. I pray that you will strike revival in their hearts, God. God, revival will not happen in this church if they do not let it happen in them. God, I pray that you let them know that. I pray that you give them a confident spirit to be able to walk for you, God, that they will go about this community and that they will reach people for you because they love you, God. God, I love you. God, help me, help me not to be scared to look foolish in front of people, but God, help me to be able to do the things that I know what it is that you put in my heart. Help me to not ignore them, but help make them so, so passionate in my heart that I chase after them with every bit of effort that you have given me, God. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ who made everything possible, who's given us the hope that nothing else can. In his name I pray, amen.